play. And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premier podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. Okay. Uh, first things first, I do apologize <laughs> for the lack of an episode last week. <laughs> if uh, anybody still subscribed to this, I have not checked the subscriber numbers, but you guys are in the dozens. <laughs> There's literally dozens. That's about it. I just got busy and then I forgot. And then it got to be Monday and I said, let's do it Monday. Then I didn't do it. And I said, you know what? what? Just skip a week. <laughs> and here we are refreshed with five plus more stories than I intended to do. Still have the same stories from last week because nothing usually happens on the week before Thanksgiving. Nothing happens Thanksgiving week. I could have skipped two weeks. I could have saved up these stories and <laughs> could have done this episode on Monday, put it out on Thanksgiving Day. But here we are. Now, next week, you'll get the uh, interview I did with Spanish Hockey Presents. Wonderful interview. Super long. 45 minutes. I'll trim it down to 43 minutes. Because <laughs> there's some stuff at the top. <laughs> and some stuff at the end. Uh, oh, what, what's, what's going on in my life? Well, I'm looking at one of them. I got a cat. Her name is Nova. She's sleeping on the couch over there. Bless you. She just sneezed. <laughs> she's adorable. Uh, she's also a turd. <laughs> she, she, for a couple of days, she was just very quiet and lethargic. It was unlike her. And then, you know, this morning she wakes up and she wants to run around and uh, scratch on my the bed frame. Which, yeah, I understand I have to get a new bed frame. But I can't afford that. I just got a cat. <laughs> Here we are. So let's hop right into this. Let's go into these stories. Uh, and also, I got this. Uh, somebody was giving away this giant bookcase f- uh, in the apartment complex. And they just said it was a bookcase. And I said, all right, great. I'll pick it up. Uh, I go to pick it up. It, there, it's like this. And I'm looking at it right now. It's it's on this wall. which And it pushed over my desk, which means the microphone's pushed over, which means I'm over here contorting like a pretzel for the next hour. By the way, this is going to be a long episode because I have not done an episode in two weeks. Episode 184. This is what it is. <laughs> um, and uh, so the, I'm looking at So the, he, he gives me this long, just nice, sturdy bookcase. And it's it looks new. Like they, they took such good care of it. And I have all my camera equipment on it now, which is great, but it takes up so much room. And it's and it's a it's a horizontal one. You can't put it vertical because the way that the shelves are, uh, it just wouldn't make sense. Uh, it's it's also insane to do that. But I'm thankful I have it. It's very nice, very solid, and uh, it really cleaned up my dining room nicely. My dining room office. <laughs> my dining room office. All right, that's the title of this episode. <laughs> You know, sometimes you got to come up with the uh, titles uh, right uh, on the spot. Here, first story comes from CBS. It's about CBS. It's come from, it comes from The Wrap, written by Tim Basinger. I wonder if he's related to Kim Basinger. <laughs> the names are not spelled the same. CBS pledges to make at least half of reality show contestants non-white starting next season. So that's 50% of uh, people who are black, indigenous, or people of color. We call them BIPOC now. A new term that was made up in the past couple of months, and people just accepted it. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> what happened to coloreds? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't say that. This is going to start for the 21-22 uh, season, the 2021-2022 season. Uh, the reality TV genre, this comes from George Cheeks, CBS, <laughs> George Cheeks, CBS <laughs> Entertainment's uh, president and CEO. The reality TV genre is an area that's especially underrepresented. And it needs to be more inclusive across development, casting, production, and all phases of storytelling. As we strive to improve all of these creative aspects, the commitments announced today are important first steps in sourcing new voices to create content and further expanding the diversity in our unscripted programming, as well as our Capital N Network. The announcements come as CBS's reality series, most notably Survivor, has been criticized for its lack of diversity. Okay, so I, oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that last part in a second. 
I have ju- I just started watching Survivor uh, within the past couple of months. And I watched Big Brother this past season, although I did not watch the finale because it just became uh, white people picking on the black people and the and the other coloreds and um and and the and the amazing race and uh you know I haven't seen a lot of seasons of survivor I've only seen I lit, I go first of all if you're going to watch survivor this is what I suggest you do go to google or whatever search engine you use and uh go to incognito mode so this does not show up in your history your cookies so you don't get essentially so you don't get stories suggested to you and that ruin the that ruin the uh the season and stuff and then google the best seasons of survivor and then or amazing race you know whatever you're gonna watch uh and make sure the lists do not say the winners make sure they barely even say people's names just look at the title of the season season 28 kayagan Season, uh, you know, 21 heroes versus villains. Also, that's one of the worst seasons. Don't watch that. That was on one. That was on. That's on like all the top five lists. Heroes versus villains. Horrible season. It just made me hate the game of Survivor. 28th, truly the best season of any reality television show I've ever seen. <laughs> 20, season 28 of Survivor. Wonderful. And then season, I think like 31 uh, they had like four or five of the people from that season from 28 come back. Uh, I think it was like Survivor Redemption or something like that. Or Second Chance, Second Chance. Uh, and that was a pretty decent season. Uh, but Heroes versus Villains, truly. There's also a season that is Whites versus Blacks. Uh, no, no, I think it's just White people. Yeah, yeah I, think it's, I think it's Whites versus Blacks. Um, and I would like to watch it. <laughs> because I think that's insane. It was a race war. It was a Survivor race war. And... I can't believe it was, it's one of the early seasons. I cannot believe that they had the chutzpah to do that. Do it now. I think that's hilarious. Any hoosers, uh, but I but uh, upon watching Big Brother, this is my first season. Um, I know I know I've mentioned this before, at least on maybe on this show, but definitely on the Constitute, not the Constitution, on uh, News Time, uh, the premiere show from YouTube.com slash Equals Comedy, uh, where I made an offhanded joke about uh big brother and how the the committee you know basically like this white supremacist uh and they are this white and they all are they are all racist and i dislike all of them except for tyler tyler's you know what i like him the most but everybody else horrible people uh whereas like six white people that were teaming up and uh, literally if you watch from that first from at least episode three on they're picking off the people of color and you know it's only when the people of color fight back by you know winning veto rounds and 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 they can and and they they veto their own you know their own livelihoods it's i mean it's insane and you know these people are not good people the people in the committee uh it's just ridiculous that you know they were able to do that and and the you know and the, what's worse is the fans would go, oh, it's not racist. It's uh, it's they're just the they're just not playing the game right. The the black people aren't playing the game right. The Asian people, the gay guys, not playing the game right. And it's it's crazy that you haven't even you even think that. <laughs> I mean, that uh, that like they don't see that. They don't see that at all. Even after like this season, what it was made during the pandemic is it was made after. Uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, and you know a litany of people of color were just killed, and and it's just, it's a shame that uh, fans don't see that. Uh, CBS I've, I've apparently sees it, um, but it's a shame that producers didn't see that. That no one spoke up and said, "Hey, this is kind of racist, man. These these six white people are picking off the people of color, the darkies." Say it just like that. Oh, God, the clock just hit 9-11. Let me take some time. <laughs> that wasn't funny. Uh, so in July, CBS said that 25% of its script development budget were going to focus on uh, people of color shows uh, beginning for next season as well. So I know I've already spoken about that. Uh, here we go. Moving on. iHeartMedia and Malcolm Gladwell team on more podcasts. This comes from The Verge, written by Ashley Karaman. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is going to be working with his uh, Pushkin Industries, his, his I guess his podcasting company, 
And they're going to, they have a two year partnership with iHeart that's going to be selling ads for them. So this is good uh, for, for multiple reasons for, I mean, for both sides, you know, Malcolm Gladwell is a big name and iHeart media is probably one of the biggest names in podcasting. Uh, maybe even radio. Uh, I, I recently had a, was talked to about something at a, at a, at a newly, at a new, not podcast company, but like at a company that did purchase two podcasting, uh, dis- not distributors, producers. Yeah. A radio giant recently purchased two podcasting companies and they're looking to expand. And somebody that works there uh, that I know reached out and was like, hey, maybe there's something coming down the pipeline within the next year. You interested? And I said, yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> so this is this is a this is a good deal uh, for for Malcolm Gladwell. I don't under I, I know iHeartMedia uh, had um, the Culture Kings, and I know that they were not particularly fond of the managing style of of iHeart. So I wonder what. Is, the cat has her paw over her face and ear as if and she's sleeping as if I have as if I'm bothering her as if me being home during the day on a Friday is bothering her uh, I but I, I do I do I do wonder if iHeart is as big as it seems to be in this podcasting space Um because you do have Spotify buying up, uh, you know, Gimlet and other podcasting companies, and then you have the radio giant, like I just mentioned, uh, and but and and they picked up two of the biggest podcasting companies, which is, uh, you know, Cadence Media and Pinnacle, Pinnacle, Pineapple, Pineapple Street Studios, Cadence Thirteen and Pineapple Street. I think that's what it's called. Uh, Intercom is, is the company that, that the person works for. I just get it all out there. No one listens to this show. It's only a couple dozen people. Um, and so I, and you know, the company that I work for my, my, my full-time job is, uh, is, uh, they own script. I mean, excuse me, scripts owns us and scripts at, for, you know, the year that I, the year and change that I was, that I am here at this job. Um, they bought, they owned uh, before a couple of months ago. Scripps sold off Earwolf, so Scripps was in that podcasting space. Uh, they sold off Stitcher. Stitcher owns Earwolf and now, but whatever. So, I mean, well, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if podcasting is as lucrative as people think it is. Uh, you do have the big, the big players, but. Only they see the money. There's no real trickle down, and not even for the people who have been doing it for 16 years, such as you know uh, Jimmy Pardo at Never Not Funny. Um, uh, either you have a Patreon that's super successful, like uh, the the Chapo Trap House. I don't know what it's called. El, the Chapo Trap House. Chapo Trap House. I think that's what it's called. And uh, Doughboys, or you have a, a giant company backing you and you have nothing to worry about or you're on your own. And it's, it's a, and by, and by giant company, I mean, you just have a company period. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure the, the podcasts over at Headgum, you know, are, aren't killing it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're killing it for their, for their terms, but they're not killing it for, you know, compared to Dax Shepard. Listen, let's take a break. The first of many. And we come back. We will have uh, more show to talk about. Oh, no. My iPad won't recognize my face. Here we go. Going to break right now. <laughs> Three, two, one, and we're back. Let's see if I can raise this microphone arm. I should get one of those uh, desk microphone arms. But also, I don't want to because this thing, this stage mic holder does everything I need it to. Okay, we're back in this show. Uh, well, let's see. I told you about the cat. Oh, let me restart this thing. Okay, I told you about the cat. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I told you about the cat. I told you about the, uh, whatchamacallit. I got a new coffee table, which is nice. I actually got a coffee table like a month ago. 
I bought some toys for the cat. She promptly hid one of them, and I, and she hid another thing, and I don't know where they are. Uh, and there's not a lot of hiding spaces in here, in my apartment. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what else has been going on in my life? Not not much. <laughs> Truly not much. Oh, the P- I, I, yes, I'm at home on a Friday uh, during the week. Uh, this is my s- second off day this week. We have had, we have to, our, our, our PTO days don't roll over, which is insane, ridiculous, especially given that they're not uh, giving us a bonus this year or a raise, or a, they're not giving us a raise this year, rather. Uh, I wish, uh, I w- you know, I, <laughs> this is, this is gonna sound so petty, but I'm one of six people out of like out of like you know 200 people, or you know 180 so people in the Atlanta offices of our company. I'm one of six that still has to come in. And one, two, three, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, this is seven. I'm one of seven that still has to come. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter at all. And uh, and you know it. Yeah, that's it's good. Still have a job. Very happy uh, that I have that, and so I can afford this place and food and stuff. Um, but uh, you know, it, it really is wearing on me. Still going to the office, and people are still at home, and they're doing half of their job. Uh, and I talk to this about my to my therapist all the time, and I talk about this to uh, uh, to people who anyone who'll listen. And uh, and you know, throughout the summer, the people working from home were making these giant mistakes. Uh, which was bleeding over to if they were making mistakes, then everybody was making a mistake. Uh, and by everybody making a mistake, I mean like our supervisor was blaming everybody for everything. Uh, and, th- and then it, it basically got to me and they're like, well, what are you doing wrong? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing my job. I'm coming to the office. I'm doing literally everything that I've been doing since the day I got here, uh, April, 2019. And, uh, and I proved it. I proved it at least two different times. Uh, and, and so that shuts them up. Um, but this week, uh, I, I'm basically filling out my PTO for the rest of the year. So I'm basically um, not working full weeks until January, <laughs> like early January. And and in one of the in one of like, you have to write down a note like as, when you put your PTO down in the computer and work day, you have you can you, you have the option to put down a note and comment and say why you're doing this. And, uh, and one of them, I said, uh, like, I was just very irritated that I had to do this. And, it was, and, and yes, I'm, yes, I'm irritated that I have to stay home. And, but I'm like, I don't want to sit at home and not do anything. I want to do something. I'd rather go to work than sit at home uh, because I'm tempted here. You know, there's movies and games and sleeping and stuff. And when at the office, I could watch YouTube, and <laughs> but also do some work. Um but uh, in one of the in the comments sections of one of them, uh, I wrote, uh, uh, "People who come into the office should be allowed to uh, roll over fifty percent of the hours," and it was just like a very frustrated thing. And I sent it through, and it got approved. <laughs> of course, obviously, it got approved. But I was I wonder if my supervisor read that and can hear the like just the stress in in that message. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, that's another thing. That's another three-minute story that you'll never get back. Let's move on. Apple is cutting the, the app's uh, development prices for smaller devs, and I wrote that horribly in the Notion page, but whatever. This comes from New York Times, written by Jack Nikus. Apple facing growing antitrust scrutiny over what it charges other companies for access to its app store, said on Wednesday that it would cut in half the fee to stock from the, uh, excuse me, the fee it took from the smallest app developers. So uh, usually they take, Apple would take 30% of your sales. Now they're going to take half of that commission. Uh, so, so it's 15% in lieu of 30%. Uh, what happens is if you sell, if you sell uh, an app on the Apple App Store, if you sell in-app purchases, then you... You get like, let's say you get like a hundred dollars, uh, for you know, 10 one for 10 ten dollar sales or something like that. Excuse me, a hundred one dollar sales. Nobody's gonna pay ten dollars for an app, even though I have done that multiple times. Uh, and this is true for both Google and and, and Apple's App Store. Um, and they, they'll they would take thirty dollars from that hundred dollars and you get seventy. Uh, 
it's a lot of money just to be able, but it, you're, but you're able to say, Hey, my app is on the Apple app store and it's in the most popular place and everybody can get it, which yes, great. But that's a lot of money even. And that's, and that's for big devs and small devs. And, and this was a problem. There's an episode of news time I did about, uh, Epic games taking on Apple and Google and, uh, it's a good episode. Check it out. Um, but this is that that was the crux of the story. Like they didn't want to pay that that thirty percent tax. Um, but now this is this is moving in the right direction, especially for a company that has uh, literally billions of dollars, uh, probably a trillion dollars. Uh, but uh, and I mean, but <laughs> this this is this makes them seem like the quote unquote good guy when people have been fighting this for literal years. Uh, so Tim Sweeney is the Epic Games chief executive, and he's and he's the one uh, that was that was leading the charge on this. Oh, and also uh, one of the problems that Epic Games faced with that was that uh, there's the stuff that they put like in the fort in Fortnite for like for buying stuff on Fortnite inside Fortnite on the App Store prices were inflated. So what they said was, hey, don't buy stuff in the App Store. Just come to Epic Games to Fortnite.com and then and we'll be able I wonder if they own Fortnite.com. <laughs> I should have bought Fortnite.com five years ago. How much money would I have? I'd probably have like they I, I probably would have said, hey, give me ten dollars. No, t- t- give me ten dollars. Uh give me uh give me uh give me two percent of sales. I would have had that. And then you know what? No cash, two percent of sales. <laughs> five years later, oh my god. You know how much money that'd probably be ten thousand dollars. <laughs> What's two percent of sales? No, I'd probably be a couple hundred thousand. I'm not good at math. Maybe even a million. How much money has Fortnite grossed? Let's get back to the topic at hand. Apple introduced its thirty percent commission in two thousand eight with its App Store, which had just had five hundred offerings then. Wow. Now it facilitates half a trillion dollars in sales, and that was in twenty nineteen. Twenty twenty people were at home. People buying, you know, video editing apps and LumaFusion is $30. Who wants to edit a video on their iPad? It's enticing, but I'm not going to do that. I got Premiere right there. Yeah, it costs $53 a month. And who, when that hits my credit card. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> I'm forcing myself to use every single uh, Adobe app in there. It's true. I am. I really am. I have Illustrator downloaded on this thing. (laughs) Do I need it? No. Am I going to learn? Hell yeah. Oh, God. Okay. So hopefully Apple is, uh, is going, I mean, there's a, there's a difference between being greedy and then just being, you know, being a dick. It, it just doesn't, I understand this is another source of revenue, but Apple has a, their hands in a lot of pockets. And I just did a, uh, this week's episode of news time is about Apple TV plus, And it was a very positive, like I didn't give it, I don't review things anymore, but it was a very, I, 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 I essentially gave it a very positive review because I like it. Also Apple TV plus now has an Xbox and PlayStation app. So it's on both of those consoles, which I'm excited for, uh, but I'm still waiting on an Android app. If we have Apple Music on Android and Chromecast and all this stuff, why can't... Is it on Chromecast with Google TV? I don't know. Spotify is. Sirius XM is. Pandora is. And I have them all three on my... I also have a Chromecast with Google TV. Very wonderful device. Oh, so good. But I just need Apple TV+. Plus. And then I'll be set. I mean, I have, they extended the free trial and I'm not going to pay $5 for it, but they extended the free trial. And, uh, so now I can finally watch it on TV instead of hunched over on my like an iPad, like or hunched over in front of the computer for the web version. All right. This is, uh, this is a story of a girl. This is the final thing for this, for this segment. Then we'll move on. ESPN shuts down esports coverage division days after layoff spree. This comes from The Wrap, written by Samson Amore. The Sports Network recently cut about 500 jobs. So 500 
jobs across the company have been let go. The esports uh, section started in 2016 and on the website and uh, ESPN, the chair I'm sitting in right now just lowered itself by itself. And I think it's because I've been moving around so much, but it lowered itself to where I'm basically parallel now <laughs> with the, with the ground. <laughs> okay. Uh, watch the video. You'll see a nice three o'clock Chad had a long day. So it started in 2016 and this was supposed to be, and I think I'm putting this in a more drastic term, dramatic term, but a saving grace for ESPN. You know, they started doing video game coverage on the, not on the website, on the, uh, on the, the network, the networks and people like it. You know, it's uh people watch drone racing and street fighter championships on TBS and, and that, like they did that for they did TBS did that for a couple of years before uh, ESPN, and so the ESPN picked up some of that stuff and uh, it seemed to do well. And then you know they they do different things like um, the when the NBA before the NBA bubble started, they had you know tournaments on there with a couple of the players playing uh, NBA two K games, the latest one. Uh, and so I mean it makes sense like people. There's a strong chance that if you watch ESPN, you like video games, whether it be Red Dead Redemption 2 or Madden 21. You, you're, you're probably a fan of video games. Um, but them, them uh, cutting these jobs does not bode well because this is because, I mean, obviously Disney is a, a, a greedy, speaking of greedy giants, uh, Disney is, is, is cutting up jobs left and right. And so this is probably the place where Disney said, we need to make some money. Uh, ESPN.com, what could we lose there that has no giant effect on our bottom line? And it's probably esports because they can get that coverage anywhere else. Whereas for ESPN, they're the leading name for regular sports coverage. No one's going to go like, I mean, obviously Bleacher Report is, is great. It's a great company, uh, but no one's going to wake up and go, I got to check, you know, Bleacher Report for the scores to the uh, Dallas game. Dallas is doing horrible this year, by the way. So I've stopped watching football also for personal reasons, because uh, they don't, uh, they don't like black people. <laughs> uh, so the esports division was quote, unable to achieve the reach or scale to break through or make a meaningful impact on the industry, says sources close to the deal. The network is instead diverting resources elsewhere, though it will continue to cover live esports events. It secured rights to several upcoming gaming competitions, including NBA 2K, Madden, V10 R League, what the hell is that? And virtual racing competition F1 Esports. With the closing of ESPN Esports, this is going to bolster what I've said earlier, gamers lose the largest and most mainstream source of sports coverage. There are other outlets covering the space, including the Esports Observer, Esports.com, or Esports Insider, but all operate with less resources and reach than ESPN's outfit did. Wow. That is, uh, that's bad. That's very bad. It's, it's worse than I thought it was going to be. So some people are apparently still contracted or employed until early January, but uh, after that, there's nothing. Um, yeah, you don't. I mean, even uh, Bob Bob Lee Bob Lay L E Y he blasts uh, he blasts ESPN for the mass layoffs because all they care about is money versus you know coverage of actual uh, sports. And there's other the, I I urge you to check out the other uh, articles that are talking about this because they'll get more in depth about it. But uh, just as a baseline, that's what that we want to get at. Listen, we got to take a break and we come back. We're going to talk about the last three stories I have. And also, my interview with Spanish Hockey Presents. Here we go. Let's go. And we're back. 
Uh, here's Chatty. <laughs> I skipped the rest of the theme song because I don't think I know it. That's the Tonight Show for uh, people who don't know the Tonight Show. You can watch select episodes and best of clips on uh, NBC's Peacock streaming service, which I think is wonderful. You know, I was uh, I was on Hulu uh, yesterday, last night, in fact, and. They had a splash screen up on the on the front page, or, or excuse me, they had a banner ad for the uh, their one of their latest shows, Trolls Topia. That's a DreamWorks property based on the movie Trolls, and I went out loud. <laughs> wow, Trolls is on Hulu now. The the Trolls, there's a new Troll show on Hulu, and then I immediately thought, well, how many episodes of uh, Trolls? The beat goes on is on Netflix. Looked it up on Wikipedia, 52 episodes, which means they've reached syndication numbers and they have ended their deal. DreamWorks has ended their deal with Netflix. The deal was a multi-year deal uh, that they extended, I want to say, in 2015. So that they... No. No. like, Like three years ago. So they had at least a seven to eight year deal, I think, or five to six year deal between five and eight years of a deal with Netflix uh, to make shows for Netflix that were new or based on properties and stuff. Uh, And then, you know, 2018, DreamWorks announces that they're going to do a prequel series to Madagascar for kids. And uh, and then that came out. I think it's Madagascar for Kids. I think that's what it's called. And uh, but now that's on Hulu. The chair just lowered itself again. That's on Hulu and Peacock. So it's a it's a shared show on those two things. And then Trolls uh, Trolls Topia, I think, is on Hulu and Peacock as well. Uh, so they ended that deal. Interesting, because uh, Kipo and the what's it called and the Wonder Beasts. I believe that just ended. Uh, Voltron ended. Uh, She-Ra's coming to an end when that airs. It's no, excuse me. She-Ra ended. There's another show on Netflix that is coming to an end that DreamWorks produces. Anyway, all the DreamWorks shows are now on Hulu and Peacock instead. I wonder. And what's interesting is that the the dra- uh, the Dragon Riders of Burke that's on Netflix that ended a couple of years ago, but the reason why I mentioned the syndication numbers for Trolls uh, World, Trolls, um, The Beat Goes On, is that uh, DreamWorks is the only distributor in, uh, in with that works with Netflix that takes its shows off of the, not takes it off the platform, but uh, airs them on its own network, Universal Kids. Which was which is under a different name at some point, or Discovery Kids, I believe. Uh, but now it's Universal Kids, which just astounds me because they take Dragons, Riders of Burke, and and the other Dragon series, and they air those on Universal for Kids, uh, which is a, a network for on cable, uh, and they air they air that. Uh, I assume they're gonna air Trolls World, uh, Trolls the Beat Goes On. <laughs> And then Trolls Topia. I assume, like, you know, once you get to syndication, used to be a, a big thing. Well, it still is a big thing because you know when a show like Big Bang Theory reaches 100 episodes, they, uh, you now you're able to take it to different networks, and you know networks will pay a certain amount of money so they can air those first hundred episodes or so. You know. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Trolls Topia is a new show, and now it's on Hulu and Peacock instead of Netflix. I uh, wonder if that still allows them to air the show outside that. We might have to take another break after, after this because uh, that was way too long. That was five minutes of me just jabbering. Speaking of cable, Viacom CBS, this comes from Variety, written by Elaine Lowe, is going to shutter its niche streaming services to focus on Paramount+. Plus. So Paramount Plus is coming uh, within the next few months. 
replacing CBS All Access. It'll be the same platform, just replacing the name. And uh, I'm sorry, there's a very beautiful variety commentator that is talking about Viacom CBS uh, report for Q3. <laughs> she distracted me. I was gonna say it. <laughs> they have these auto play videos. So what they're going to do is they're they uh, Viacom CBS has these very niche services that you can get on platforms like uh, Apple TV Plus as an add-on channel or Amazon Prime uh, channels, video channels, or you know by themselves uh, like MTV Hits and Nick Hits and Comedy Central Now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? And probably that BET plus one. I think that's what it's called. Uh, and they're going to, and they're going to focus their efforts on two things, on two things, the pay for, uh, Paramount plus CBS all access, which is going to become Paramount plus, which I just think they keep it at CBS all access. Cause I think CBS all access is more synonymous with viewers than Paramount plus. I think C- like CBS, you know, CBS. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense, but whatever. Um, so what was I get, what was I getting at? Oh, okay. So they're going to focus on two things: Paramount Plus and Pluto TV. Pluto's free, doesn't cost a thing, and they're building on that time and time again. The company, which is coming up in its first year anniversary of a merger between Viacom and CBS, it's going to sunset. Oh my God, I have a sneeze coming on. Is going to sunset these services. Uh, it did while it did not confirm which of the smaller ones are going to be you know absorbed into Paramount Plus. You can assume that you know Nick hits Comedy Central now. The other ones are are going to. Uh, let's see, kid friendly Noggin, which has at least two point five million subscribers to his name, is not going to be shuttered, according to a Viacom CBS spokesperson. So they're they're really trying to set the stage for this one, one thing, which is smart. Um, but we'll see how this plays out for them. I still think CBS is a better name. This next one comes from the Wall Street Journal. Because remember, I'm subscribed right now. Written by Joe Flint. TV uh, targeted ads headed soon to network TV. So this is the thing I was I'm afraid of if I ever get like a, a smart TV. Yeah, and yes, I do have a I have a Google e- ecosystem. Uh, I have I have multiple Google Homes throughout the house. I understand that. Uh, I get it. They know all of my information. I don't want to watch TV and and then like you know I'm watching a rerun of Friends and then they show me ads for HBO Max. I don't want that. I don't want that at all. But everything else I'm fine with. <laughs> So this is why that's why I don't want a smart TV. I tell people to avoid smart TVs. Just get a Roku, Fire TV, Stick, or uh, Apple TV, or a Chromecast. You don't need you don't need a smart TV. Also, and you know, and I've had my TV for uh, six or seven years now. It's wonderful, 1080p. Does what I need to do. Um, but it still it still turns on as fast as it did the day I got it. When you have one of these web OS TVs like LG and um, Samsung and and Sony and all these things and Vizio, they have, you know, just like any computer, it has like RAM and it's going to eventually that RAM is going to get full and you can't access the same amount as RAM, of RAM that you had on day one when you uh, on day 5000. So I'd rather have the, the thing I have. So there's going to be. uh blah, blah, blah. Ads, maybe, possibly, coming into your television. Nielsen, the nation's leading TV ratings firm, on Tuesday said it would start measuring such targeted advertising on a national basis next year. The lack of a national measurement system for such ads has been a hurdle for brands and networks. The new system will mark a fundamental shift in how Nielsen tabulates commercial viewership. Instead of calculating an average audience for all ads in a program at its current practice, as in its current practice, it will measure each ad individually, which is necessary for targeted advertising to work. 
The move is expected to boost the value of TV commercials, which has been under pressure as broadcast and cable networks <coughs> excuse me, have been losing viewers to streaming services and brands have flocked to digital advertising. Nielsen said it was teaming up with AT&T's DirecTV and Dish Network Corp, two of the nation's largest pay TV distributors and smart TV manufacturer Vizio. The partnership will give Nielsen data from 55 million devices via smart TVs and set-top boxes. Now, I, do, I don't mind being a part of Nielsen. That's fine. You know, when you watch um, Hulu or Amazon or any one of these, when you watch YouTube TV even, uh, you are foregoing, like you basically in the terms of service are saying, hey, it's okay if somebody measures what I watch. The problem is I, you don't, I just don't want, I just don't want what happens on the internet to happen when I'm watching TV. It just it just doesn't seem uh, right to me. Anyway, this is that was an interesting thing. I might do a news time episode on this so I can dig a little deeper, uh, but I don't have the time now. Last but not least, this also comes from Wall Street Journal, written by Benjamin Mullen and Keech Hagee. Uh, BuzzFeed is going to acquire Huffington Post and stock deal with Verizon Media. So, BuzzFeed, new media. Uh, Huffington Post, also new media, started in uh, 2006, I believe, when I was reading this. Doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, BuzzFeed's going to purchase Huffington Post, which has been um, not doing well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in turn, Verizon is going to get some stock from BuzzFeed, which is a truly a smart deal because BuzzFeed is everywhere on the Internet. Um, so that's good. John Peretti, BuzzFeed's founder and chief executive, will run the combined company. And uh, BuzzFeed will lead the search for a new editor in chief at Huffington Post. This is a great deal for uh, for BuzzFeed, I believe. Because, uh, you know, Huffington Post, that's going to give them, as, you know, as sensationalistic, sensationalistic as I think Huffington Post is, uh, with their headlines especially, I do, I do find that this is going to help solidify BuzzFeed in a more serious context. And that is something that they sorely need, uh, especially when they have serious reporting, when they have good features that are under the BuzzFeed banner. You know, they have good features on sexual assault, you know, uh, Harvey Weinstein story or something like that. Uh, the cat woke up. And uh, I mean, this is, this is good. This is a really good purchase for them. And, you know, with Verizon able to get their get that stock money back, baby. I mean, that's just a that's just a whole other ball game. Mister Peretti said BuzzFeed executives will undertake a review of Huff, Huff Posts. Because remember, Ariana Huffington left business before making any significant moves, such as cutting staff or hiring additional employees. In a note to employees, Mister Peretti said Huff Post attracts readers from wealthier demographics, which is true. Last year, uh, Vice Media acquired Refinery29, Vox Media acquired New York Media, and Group 9 Media, Inc. Uh, acquired Pop Sugar. So these everybody is combining, becoming one giant conglomerate. In 20 years, everybody will be the same thing. Everybody will be under uh, the New York Wall Street Journal Times <laughs> post. Okay, listen, that's it. I got to go. If you like what you heard here, head to the website, cpluscomedy.com, where you can see other things like interviews with Spanish Aki Presents. Seriously, hands down, my favorite interview of the year because it was uh, five brown people, including myself, just talking. Just talking about what pisses us off in the industry about what, what white people do in the industry. Uh, and it's good. So check it out. It'll be up next week. I promise on Monday at the earliest, on Tuesday, at the latest. Definitely check it out. She is just sauntering over here, this stupid cat. She looked over at me like, what are you doing in my house? Hi, Nova. All right. And uh, come here. She's yawning. She's very tired. And uh, so, yeah, it'll be up. Video and audio form uh, on this feed. Video form on YouTube.com slash C plus comedy. We can see a video version of this show. 
as well as News Time, our premiere show, which uh, I take one story every week and I dissect it. This week, of course, was about Apple TV+. Plus. It's been a year and a pretty good year for them, too. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, all that stuff, at C Plus Comedy. Just look us up. Uh, me, at Chad Black White. Rate, review this show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Tell your friends about it. I got to go. Goodbye. <laughs>You know what's funny? I played the wrong thing. I'm going to say goodbye again right now. Here we go. Goodbye.